Mr. Morris. The court, Justices, Mr. Nelmark. Uh, my name is David Morris. I'm here today on behalf of Kathy Cowan. Uh, we're here today with regards to this application for the decision of the Court of Appeals uh, affirming the District Court's decree of def foreclosure entered in September of 2014. The issue we bring before the court today is whether the statutory language found in Iowa Code 615.1 providing all liens should be extinguished uh, refers solely to the judgment lien uh, in the instant foreclosure action or whether it includes all liens uh, including the mortgage lien upon which the foreclosure judge raise a question I have uh, Mr. Morse that is raised I, I, I find much of what you say in your briefing uh, interesting and, and frankly somewhat persuasive uh, that all liens has to mean something more than just the judgment lien. But here's a, here's a potential unfairness that troubles me. Uh, let's say I hold a second mortgage on the home, okay? And the mortgagee that holds the first mortgage initiates foreclosure proceedings and kind of messes around and the two years runs. Uh, so then under 615.1, all liens are extinguished, is that right? And as the second, I'm, I'm out of luck? I mean, I wasn't the one that messed around. <laughs> Indeed, uh, I don't know that it would uh, perhaps uh, prejudice. All doesn't mean all? All means all in the sense of the uh, any liens that the in this particular bank U, or U.S. bank would have been able to assert uh, relative to their foreclosure action. What, what we have here, I, the question becomes: six fifteen point one sets a special statute of limitations. If you're going to come and foreclose on my house, and you're going to take my house, the law says you have a two-year window to get that accomplished. If you go to all the trouble of getting a foreclosure decree against my house you have two years in which to go forth and sell it at sheriff sale or do something to effectuate the relief that you're seeking in the court. Uh, you have a little bit of a window on the rescission statute, which gives you a mulligan if you want to. Uh, you can, if you timely rescind, perhaps put yourself back in the spot you were before, but clearly the design and intent of 615.1 is to require a creditor such as the bank here to either go forward and proceed or you lose all the rights that you might have. In this particular case, on my case in any event, Ms. Callan, uh, it is clear that uh, in the first case that was filed in Polk County, a foreclosure decree was entered. There were a couple of uh, interrupted attempts at uh, sheriff's sale where it was canceled for whatever reason. And then more than two years elapsed before they attempt the notice of rescission in March of 2012, and then uh, effectively uh, over a year later, we start this second lawsuit. Uh, the purpose and the goal, as set forth in my brief and in the amicus brief uh, regarding the purpose and the reasoning why this statute is what it is and what it was intended to do, is just that. It gives the creditor both a timeline and a deadline uh, statute of limitations to either do what you're going to go do or you lose your rights to go do it. And I, as a homeowner, I, I sit here and I don't have that uh, impending what's going to happen next. I don't have that, uh, imp are they coming, are they not coming? And that's exactly what that statute's designed to do, whether that impacts on a second lien holder or something along that lines I don't think is necessarily implicated in, in, in our case here today. Uh, the, the beauty I guess of the counterbalance of that is you're, you're sitting in a house where you're, you're not paying for and you're doing it literally for years. Exactly. So, uh, there's the counterbalance of that as well. Uh, the bank is the one that ought to have the impetus to do something. I understand that. But there really is no impetus for the homeowner who's sitting in there, I think in your client's case now for six years, now going on seven years, uh, what, what's, why is that a downside for that particular individual? Well, I, I, Your Honor, I guess I would answer that in saying that's what the law says they're supposed to go do. There's no showing us, I mean, the, the concept of is it fair or is it, is it not fair to the bank 
I, I would submit uh, the statute. Well, but, but you're arguing policy issues, you know, uh, that uh, it's fair to one or fair to the other, and you're saying that was the purpose of the underlying statute was to move these things along and do those things, but there's the countervailing policy as well. Well, we have statute of limitations on all sorts of different kinds of cases, Your Honor. I mean, if I go out today and I run a red light and I strike someone in the car and I, I hurt them, uh, if they don't get around to suing me in two years, uh, I, I get a free walk on that. I mean, call it what you want, a, a free walk, a free step away, whatever you want it to be. There's a statute of limitations on almost every type of cause of action. If you don't do what you're supposed to go do in the timeline allotted, you're just out of luck. Uh, we have uh, a situation here where uh, this particular statute uh, is intended for the sole purpose of saying after two years, you're out of luck. Uh, right, wrong, or indifferent, it's just what the law provides at this point. Well, why don't you bring it, address some of the arguments of, of the bank. Um, it does say all liens. I mean, we've all read it, sure. um, of course. Um, but we are dealing with a, uh, a section of the law that deals with judgments. And I think the, the title of the subsection is execution on certain judgments prohibited. And then if you look at, at 615.1, as you know, I mean, we can all read it, but it, but it mentions judgments three or four times. Um, it is true when it talks about liens, and this is the highlight of your linguistic argument, of course, all liens shall be extinguished. Right. Um, but, but although it's plural, a judgment lien, of course, uh, uh, by operation of laws, is, is a lien on all property. It's conceivable that someone could have multiple properties and there'd be multiple judgment liens out there. I, I, you know, I, um, doesn't the meaning of all liens depend somewhat on the context? And the context seems to be judgments. Um, and what it's basically saying then is, is if you get a foreclosure judgment and you want to have the benefit of that foreclosure judgment, you got to do what you got to do within two years. And if not, the judgment uh, is null and void, but that that doesn't affect the underlying debt. I mean, I'm, I'm parroting back the bank's argument, but I'm giving you an opportunity to, to Sure. Respond. Well, I guess I would respond. I, I believe that uh, the legislative history behind both the predecessor version uh, and the, you know, the 2006 amendments where this all lien shall be extinguished language was added for the first time uh, shows that we're talking about something not just judgments but the liens as well that go with it. And, you know, and but I- But it'd be worth, but, but well, go ahead, go ahead. I, I, excuse I, me, that, that, that's fine, uh, perhaps. What I would say is that uh, that language, this court and, and the Court of Appeals historically have said that the language is both clear and unambiguous in this particular instance. I mean, there's a long line of cases that says that statute says what it says, it means what it says, and it's not unclear as to what it says, both in before the 2006 amendment. Make your best case. Let, uh, just for purposes of argument, assume that I, I find it ambiguous. I mean, I, I, sure. understand, I understand your plain language argument. I don't mean to suggest I'm rejecting it, but assume that, that I don't buy the ambiguity, and then I've got to do the contextual work. Um, refute the argument that, boy, this is in the judgment judgment chapter, and it's entitled judgment, you know, execution of certain judgments prohibitive. It's 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 a garden of roses, and then all of a sudden, in the middle of it, we have a daisy. Um, <laughs> um, shouldn't we regard it all as flowers? Well, uh, you know, I'm kind of allergic to flowers, so I. I <laughs> You know, and Sorry, I, I didn't mean it. That's okay. What, what I like to think of is here is, you know, we're, we're trying to, in this particular case, there seems to be an underlying theme, and this isn't going to be fair to the bank. Somebody's going to get a free house if we win, okay? That's what the import of that statute is. You know, we're talking about a bank here who apparently went to all the trouble to sue us on two different occasions, couldn't figure out how to get a share sale done in two years for whatever reason, don't know why, don't really care, but their, lien, their, their rights and their liens in this thing are gone. The case law that w I cited in my brief and, and uh, the amicus brief indicates that's consistent with all the earlier decisions of the court that, um, you know, you know that, the, uh, that there's one lien, it's here, if you don't, these are special creatures. Uh, the mortgage concept or the, the note and the mortgage and et cetera, 
all one judgment lien, all one well, lien. But, but, but I mean, the case law suggests, and, and please correct me if I'm wrong, but the case law suggests, the old case law distinguishes between the underlying debt and, and the judgment lien. Um, and if you, if you have an erroneous foreclosure action that ordinarily doesn't extinguish, I mean, I, I understand your argument it does here, but or, ordinarily the mortgage debt is separate from a judgment obligation. Uh, judge, I'm sorry, what's an erroneous judge, uh, foreclosure action? Oh, uh, somebody didn't serve proper notice. Um, what's void? Sure, uh, yeah, but that Well. Yeah, it, so the judgment is void, but it doesn't, it doesn't extinguish underlying mortgage debt. Right. Here, though, what we have is we, we have a situation where there actually was a foreclosure decree. I mean, there are certain circumstances, presumably, where the first action is flawed. Uh, perhaps no, no personal service, didn't have jurisdiction, uh, forgot to name a party, uh, junior lien holder pops up, someone forgot to look on the abstract or the abstractor missed it. Those are unique situations for which there might be different remedies. But here we don't have that. We have all the parties that were necessary to this were part of the first action, and all the parties that were necessary were part of the second action. Uh, we have clearly, uh, they attempted this rescission. They were, I think, 45 or 48 days past the two-year limit. Uh, but it, the statute and the cases, and, and you know, there seems to be the line of cases that talk about uh, you know, if you're outside that two-year limit, that's what it's supposed to be. There's cases in uh, Schulte, in this, this decision. Uh, this court in Schulte said uh, 615.1 is a special statute of limitations regarding foreclosure action tasked with the legislative purpose of aiding debtors. There's a couple of cases in the, in the Court of Appeals, Hammond, one I'm somewhat fond of, where that uh, uh, decision gave one of my clients a house uh, regarding uh, the bank too little too late outside of uh, the particular uh, two-year line. You know, it's interesting. You call it a statute of limitations, and I, and I understand why, um, but I'm struggling once again with the language. Um, if it's a statute of limitations, why didn't they call it a statute of limitations? I mean, instead, it's execution on certain judgments prohibited. Um, I, I go back to Schulte and I'd say this, co this court, the Supreme Court has already said it's a special statute of limitations regarding foreclosure actions. Uh, not my language, language that's in the case law, uh, language coming down from this particular court. Was that uh, 615-1, was that execution on certain judgments prohibited, was that title in the previous version of the section before the 2006 legislation was adopted? Uh, I'd, I'd have to go back to the uh, extensive amicus brief as to the statutory history. I, I think the language in the section and the caption is probably the same all the way through. It's your theory. I understand Professor Bauer agrees, disagrees with you. You've got an amicus who has a different theory. But your theory, as I understand it, is that in 2006, the legislature, uh, in effect, changed 615.1 to achieve the result that you uh, claim should occur in this case, right? Well, I think the language uh, under the 2006 amendment adding the, uh, where it says quite clearly, if this doesn't happen before uh, your rights become unenforceable by operation of the statute of limitations, the 615.1, two years, then this is what happens to you. Y you lose your ability to enforce the judgment, the, a judgment, the judgment on that foreclosure and the liens and such, and there's some exception to that, which is uh, regarding, I suppose, a set off or a counterclaim. If for some reason I, as the homeowner, decide I have a claim against the mortgage company did something wrong to me, I it allows them to, to uh, uh, you know, raise those claims as set off or counterclaim. But the language uh, clearly says that if you go two years from the date of the entry of the judgment, uh, and that happens, then any judgment entered in those actions are void, done deal, all liens are extinguished, et cetera, and you can't issue any execution. Uh, if that's not a limitations of an action uh, and time bar the deadline, then I don't know what it, what it would otherwise be, uh, contrary to, or regardless of what the, the, the little caption uh, 
that that section, the title, if you will, uh, says. I guess I have a question then relating back to the, the title of it. It says execution on certain judgments. So if you get your foreclosure judgment and you immediately get your recipe for execution out and set it for sale, which I assume happened here, it sounds like, then we had some delay, but doesn't the filing of that execution within that two years, are you saying then you have to not only execute, but also sell the property and get the deed and do all these things within that two year period of time? Is that your position? In the current case, Your Honor, there's yeah. never been an execution issued. The foreclosure decree was entered and this case was then appealed to the Court of Appeals and now is here before this court. In the first case, uh, dating back to... Um, That's why I'm going back to the yeah. first one where the, I think, according to my records, then the, the actual foreclosure decree was in February 11th of 2010. Then I'm getting the impression, and you correct me if I'm wrong, that the recipe for execution issued, it was set for sheriff sale, but then never occurred. I mean, yeah, is that recipe for execution within that two-year period of time? Is that executing on your on if, the if certain you go judgment? For, if you go forward with it and get a deed of sheriff sale, whoever the winner at the at the sheriff sale is, that has to be concluded because the language in the statute also talks about this time frame. Um, uh, you know, in, in March of 2010, in the first case, they issued a special execution and then canceled that USB's request. In January 2012. Uh, USB asked a special, another second special execution issued, and it was canceled at the request of USB, and uh, and then returned unsatisfied. So I, I don't know why that did or didn't happen. I wasn't involved in this case at the time. There's nothing in the record, but they didn't go forward. They didn't do their sheriff sale. In, in theory, I suppose. Did you they could cancel the execution, or uh, that's where I guess I it's been that's too long since I've been doing this. But did they? just simply cancel the sheriff sale, but not necessarily the execution? Well, you have to re if you get a special execution each time. Excuse me, sure. I if you cancel the uh, sheriff sale, then the sheriff would typically uh, return the execution unsatisfied because uh, it's going to expire anyway. Uh, so that, that, that execution ex dies or is void or what, you can't use it again. And then you got to go pay them their money again and you fill out your forms and then they start another one and then you can cancel it. Sheriff sales can get canceled, they quite frequently do. They get uh, postponed, something didn't happen correctly. But there's a, a lifespan to them. You have to go do something within a time frame where you get to start over. And so in this particular instance, for whatever reason, I don't know, uh, USB started the process twice, canceled the process twice, and then never did anything else. The timeline runs, and it runs by quite a bit. They come back in, and you get the um, 654.17, you know, there's a, there's a procedure where if they wanted to, they could have gone in and done this rescission process, uh, which is, gives them another bite at the apple, but they didn't follow that. And so if you look at those two things in con conjunction, th these clearly talk about these kinds of debts, m mortgage loans and mortgage notes and whatever, uh, for the foreclosure of those against your the, the collateral. In, in, in the cases, you know, there's a lot of cases out there where if, if the bank had done something within the two-year time frame, we, we wouldn't be here. They'd be timely. It, they go again and go again or whatever. But uh, it, there has to be a level of finality, and the level of finality is two years. It's a, it's a date. It's, it doesn't say two years and a day. Two years and 45 days. It doesn't say anything else but what it says. And so, what we would submit in, in our particular case with regards to Ms. Callan's. You, you may sum up, Mr. Morris. I'm sorry, am I out of time? Uh, for those reasons, Your Honor, we'd ask that you, uh, this court, reverse uh, the decision of the Court of Appeals and determine that the uh, underlying foreclosure action is, uh, was time barred. Thank you. Thank you as well. Mr. Nelmar. May it please the court, Mr. Morse. It is undisputed that appellant Kathy Callan has not made a payment on the mortgage at issue in more than eight years. It's further undisputed that she doesn't even live in this house anymore. She moved to Texas before the current foreclosure action was even filed. But this case is not just about Kathy Callan. If the court holds that simply because of the passage of two years time after a decree, 
that borrowers are suddenly entitled to free houses, those borrowers are going to come out of the woodwork. We'll see case after but case. But that's what statute of limitations do. People have all kinds of claims, and if they're stale, they can't make them. Why should the banks get any special treatment if they miss a statute of limitations, if this statute of limitations is intended, if we construe the statute of limitations against you? And that's what they do. What the appellant is calling the statute of limitations is section 615.1. As Justice Apple noted, the title of that subsection is execution on certain judgments prohibited. But if you take a step even further back, the entire chapter, chapter 15, 615, is titled limitations on judgment. If you drill down into it further, the sentence right before the phrase all liens are extinguished talks about judgments being null and void, and the sentence right after it talks about executions on judgment. All of the context. Yeah, but Mr. Nelmark, all right, so, but, but if you're right, uh, wh why even have 654.17 on rescission? Why would a lender ever need or bother to rescind? Why would they care? I mean, your client filed the rescission. I mean, is, to paraphrase Chief Justice Roberts, was your, your, your client just a, a chump to do that? It didn't need to do it at all? <clears throat> there, the main reason that you might want to rescind is you might want to withdraw this before the passage of two years has occurred and the judgment is no longer valid. Let's say a loan modification is worked out after a year. The judgment is on the books. You don't want to wait for it to expire. You want to remove it by rescinding your judgment and simply reinforcing the mortgage. You have the mortgage anyway, under your logic. You don't need to bother, right? The rescission takes away the judgment. The mortgage itself always exists under either circumstance. Right, so what's the, what's the need to rescind? Why don't you just do nothing? Because the rescission moves the judgment. The mortgage stayed the same without, but if you want to remove that judgment, let the lender get the fresh start, start the modification. Under 615, under your interpretation of 615.1, or at least if you're, if, 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 I think your interpretation 615.1, everything remains except the judgment. If you rescind, you lift the judgment. Right. So why bother having a rescission provision? It, it, it just it makes no sense. That's what it allows you to do. It removes the judgment, which would have remained. But Only it, for two years. Yeah, but in, in, in your, your client removed the judgment after it rescinded the judgment after it was expired. Why bother doing that? Well, there's a couple of reasons for that. If we turn to 654.17 about rescission, we have to determine how long you can rescind and restore the mortgage if, in fact, 615.1 took it away. As the court noted in Schulte, that statute of limitations might be 10 years or 20 years, not just the two. But even if the appellant were correct on 615.1, and even if they were correct that 654.17 reflects back to 16. 615.1, which it doesn't say. It brings up Justice Zager's point, which is what is the two years referenced in 615.1? Is it the date that the sheriff's sale has to occur, or is it simply the date that an execution has to issue? If we look to the Deaton case cited in our brief, it says it's the execution. And if you read 615.1, it says that after two years, no execution shall be issued. It does not say no sale shall occur on an execution issued prior to the two years. So under that interpretation, even if they're right on the first two points, the mortgagee's rights have not been extinguished by 615.1. As long as they've rescinded, well, that execution is still valid before the sheriff's sale takes place. But going back to the context of 615.1 and the five words the appellant's case is built on, all liens are extinguished. The titles, the surrounding sentences, all indicate that it's judgment liens. And this court's precedents say we look at words in their ordinary meaning in context, and we don't look at phrases in isolation. To use a very simple real world analogy here, if you're at your favorite restaurant and you look at the section that says entrees, and you see there's the beef and the fish and the chicken, and then it, right underneath that it says all items come with the side salad and your choice of potato. You know from context that it's referring to the entrees in that section. What the appellant wants to do is flip to the back of the menu, order a Diet Coke, and then ask for their free Caesar salad and french fries. 
saying only one entree comes with a salad because you're reading all liens to mean just one lien, right? No, it's all judgment liens. There may be. Would there be more than one? There are a couple of reasons. The easiest one is that there could be more than one property at issue. You can have a judgment dealing with multiple properties and thus multiple liens. Well, let's go. I, I, I didn't really hear your answer to Justice Mansfield's question on uh, 654.17. Uh, assuming we buy your interpretation, what's the purpose of the rescission of foreclosure? Um, I mean, or even better, what's the purpose of that statutory provision? Um, of course, if you got, if you got a, a uh, uh, foreclosure judgment, you can always release it. You can always come to some kind of agreement with the party. I mean, why? what is the purpose of this 654.17, if you're correct in your interpretation of 615.1? It removes the judgment that was on the books and gives the, the debtors the fresh start. So 615.1 does benefit the debtors. It removes the specter of the sheriff sale that could happen at any point, and it requires the mortgage or to or the mortgagee to start over. At best, that provides more time to allow the lenders to work. Another, I mean, it re-triggers various timelines and so forth under a foreclosure action. Absolutely. So yeah, you're back to ground zero, and you've you've got you you have to reserve various notices and contact people and so forth and so on. And so I take it the rescission achieves, from the debtor's perspective at least, uh, some delay. Yeah, the, the, that's what 615.1 does. At best, it lets them have time to work out a modification, perhaps stay at their home permanently. But at minimum, it starts over the process, requires. And your point, so your point is the lender might want to do this to give comfort to the debtor, is that the point? Well, I, I'm not, yeah, I, I'm trying to understand. That is, one, that is one basis. In this particular case, rescission would allow the mortgagee's rights to be in place even if 615.1 had the interpretation that the appellant urges. To Justice Mansfield's points earlier about the unfairness of interpreting all liens to wipe out all liens, I think from all context, it's clear that it applies to judgment liens. But what if the appellant is right? What if those five words, all liens shall be extinguished, means all liens? What happens? Well, it's not only the mortgagee that filed the foreclosure action. It's anyone who holds a second mortgage or a third mortgage. It's anyone who holds a mechanics lien on the property. Well, but can't you, I mean, can't you interpret all liens to mean all liens related to the party that brought the foreclosure action? I mean. I mean, I hear what you say, all liens, in theory, means the world. Um, I, I find that very troubling and, I, and not likely to go there. Um, but but it, it seems to me there's a case that says, well, all liens means all liens that the, re, may relate to the, to the person who filed a foreclosure and not to everybody else. I, I think every single thing about 615.1 indicates that all liens shall be extinguished means all judgment liens. And that's what three district courts and three panels of the courts of appeal have held. But if that's not right, if we say no, it's a strict interpretation and all liens must mean all liens, which is what the appellant's arguing, it creates all of these problems and unintended consequences. I think it has to be one or the other, not some third secret meaning that doesn't use the context and doesn't use the words of the statute, but simply is convenient to get the result that the I'm not wants. so sure, frankly. I, uh, um, so, so a party brings a foreclosure action. Um, everybody's on notice. The various proceedings are happening, um, and then, and then, for whatever reason, I mean, so the bank has two years to get her done, and if that doesn't happen, the bank is out of luck. The lender really might not be a bank. It is is out of luck. Um, period. Um, I mean, I think that's a plausible interpretation of the statute. If the legislature simply wanted to say that all mortgages are extinguished or that this particular lender's mortgage is extinguished, it would have been very easy to say that. Well, I agree with that. It would have been very easy to say. To, I mean, frankly, the language isn't ideal um, from, from anybody's perspective, probably. Um, it would have been easy to say, um, it would have been easy to express 
uh, your client's position by for by carrying in instead of all liens, all judgment liens um, um, held by the you know the party bringing the foreclosure action um, doesn't say that. We when I do think it's fair to say we we should attempt to construe these statutes in a way that makes coherent whole. I think we do need to look at six. 54.17 as we construe it um, and it seems to me though that the argument could be made that that uh, as I just did that it's designed simply to deal with the liens that might be held by the party bringing the foreclosure if that meaning were adopted then you also have to reconcile 615.1 with 654.17 and the constitutional arguments in the case so we, we th it, all judgment liens is what is referenced it's easy the case is resolved everything is consistent with case law and context if you go down the rabbit hole of saying that it, it's some other meaning of all liens we have to figure out the statute on 654.17 which this court reserved in Schulte and say if that say that it's 10 years or or 20 years you have to resolve the issue of when does the two years expire is it for the execution that has to be issued, or is it for the actual sheriff sale? And I think the Deaton case sides with us on that point. And then we also have the constitutional argument. The court held in Berg and other cases that you can have statutes of limitations that resolve judgments without impairing contracts and drawing the constitutional scrutiny related to due process. Here in 2006, when this was adopted, we have a mortgage that's already in place. If you now say that that mortgage has all its rights extinguished after two years, that is of doubtful constant constitutionality. When the other meaning is equally reasonable, and I would argue much more supported by context, you don't have that problem. It's just oh, but a restriction. Can't you change statute limitations? I mean, I'm sorry. Can't can't you change the statute of limitations without offending, uh, con you know, notions of constitutionality? I mean, they bob up and down with some regularity, um, and and. I think that's been generally upheld. You, you can adjust statutes of limitations. I, I would submit that that's not what happened here. You have 654.17, which refers to the statute of limitations. I believe that would be chapter 614, titled Limitations on Actions. That was not adjusted. 615.1 itself doesn't describe it as being a statute of limitations. It simply says that the judgment expires. Can you, if Callan wasn't making pay payments, why didn't U.S. Bank see through either of these foreclosure actions all the way to a sale? In the first case, there were a couple of delays. The first one is that Callan uh, filed for a motion for reconsideration or something along those lines, which prevented the, the first sheriff sale from taking place. In the second instance, related to the original foreclosure action, the bank put it on hold so that they could do their own internal investigation. This was the time of all of the mortgage fraud scandals, wanted to make sure everything had been done right, and it was. They found no problems. Thus, they subsequently initiated a new foreclosure action and have been pursuing that diligently. The only reason we haven't had a sheriff sale is because of this appeal. The last point I will make is that although we would see a lot of litigation about borrowers coming forward and trying to get these free houses, the position urged by the appellant is not good for borrowers overall. Yes, Ms. Callan would get her free house that she never paid for, and if more cases were filed, some individual borrowers might get that same relief. But it doesn't help borrowers as a whole. Because if a, if a mortgagee can work with a borrower try to get a loan modification, try to do any number of things other than foreclosure. Yeah, but all you got to do is go in and rescind. I mean, so you file the judgment, you, you file your foreclosure action, and then you know that within two years, you better file your rescission if, if, if you want to continue negotiations. I, I assume it's quite common that negotiations, shall we say, speed up toward the end of the foreclosure period. I, I, I take it human nature's that way. Um, and if they're ripe enough, then you just, you just do your rescission under 564.17. Uh, that's a lot of risk to take out of the goodness of your heart to try to help a borrower to risk losing all of your mortgage rights. And that's something that, that no case has ever held that these would be wiped out. So a ruling that provided these free houses would be a shock not only to lenders, but the entire real estate community. I see that I'm out of time. Are there any other questions? Thank you, counsel. Rebuttal argument, Mr. Morris. Um, 
again, this comes down to this focus is on uh, the end result. Uh, let's focus not on what the result is in this particular case. Let's focus on what the law does say. And the law is pretty clear on this issue that if you uh, don't do something within two years, the date of the entry of the judgment, bad things happen to you as a creditor. It's a simple bright line test. It's basically a calendar. Put it on your Google, Google calendar, whatever you wanna go do. You have a timeline. I, I agree. I, I do debtor creditor law for 27 some odd years now, almost 28. Uh, there are times when you try to work with the creditor. That, there's no a record in, in this particular case that there was ever any attempts. My client just wasn't paying. No one was trying to work a deal. No one was trying to get something accomplished on the backside. That was it. Uh, to go ask, and, and I would say that the statements about what the underlying reasons for stopping the sheriff's sale don't appear in, in the record in this case, but regardless, um, there's no evidence that shows that there was somebody trying to make a deal. Would you agree, Mr. Morris, that if what the legislature meant to do in 2006 was change a law and essentially give the mortgagee kind of a two-year window to either get the foreclosure done, uh, uh, the sheriff sale done, excuse me, or lose all rights to the house and wipe out everybody else's rights to the house except for the owner, right? Uh, wipe out uh, any any lien, say, that might an improvement district might have or a mechanics lien or anything like that. That's giving a lot of power to that all that those five words, as Mr. Melmark puts it. Would well, you agree? Yeah. Actually, Judge, I don't. I mean, I think this is pretty straightforward. At the end of the day, we're talking about specific classic kind of creditor-debtor relationships on a house, a mortgage. It says you got to go do what you got to go do. Wait, are, you, you, are you suggesting that all these liens, other liens, are extinguished by that, really? No, I'm talking about the relationship between U.S. Bank and Ms. Cowan. I mean, where do you get that stopping point? It either says... I understand the point that all liens may mean all judgment liens, and I understand the, me, the, con the notion that all liens could mean all liens, but what is, wh where and how do you, how would you achieve the result that all liens just means all liens in favor of the mortgagee? Well, I think in, in the context of this particular case, that's, that's what that means. I think that's an issue perhaps for a different day, but the junior lien holders don't have judgments at that particular point. And there's cases that say if you have, you know, uh, for example, um, you know, you know, some Tiffany cases, you know, if you had a separate kind of security agreement, you go, you go take care of that, you can go do that separately. We, we don't have that case. This is a simple deal. One mortgage, one property, one debt. They sued. They didn't hit their timeline. You know, the, the, the notion of the uh, rescission statute as sort of the do-over in this particular instance, uh, if, if they were going to do it over, do it within two years. That's, that's simple. Can, counsel, in view of the fact that the, the mortgage was in place at the time of the 2006 amendment, uh, and under your interpretation, that'd be wiped out if they didn't meet the two-year time clock. Uh, does that um, violate, a, or is that an unconstitutional impairment of contract, and why not? I, I would say it isn't, Your Honor, as, as was noted over here by uh, Justice Apple, I believe, you know, that statute of limitations to go up and down. They changed. This didn't really change anything. It wasn't in the middle of the case. When they filed the lawsuit, they knew what the law was. First lawsuit, they knew what the law was. You know, don't, don't we uh, avoid that constitutional question by interpreting the statute to mean all judgment liens rather than no, I, the, I don't the waterfront? Think so because there's a, there's a merger. If you go and you foreclose your mortgage, there's case law that says that you've, ex you've exhausted the measure of your remedies. You can't keep coming back again and again uh, on that. You, you file that suit, it's, it's, it's all one big happy suit, for lack of a better way of saying it. That's how I think of it, is that all of that's in, in there. You can't come back and do it a second time w or a third time. Would it be unconstitutional to, to read the statute to extinguish liens of other people, the mechanics lien, the second mortgage? Um, you know, I guess I'd have to think through that, Your Honor. I don't have a good answer for that aspect of it, real candid. I don't think that's implicated in this particular case. I do think, though, that the, the right reading of this, at least, is in regards to the current lawsuit. Uh, the liens of U.S. Bank in relationship to Ms. Callan's house are extinguished. Uh, and that's really what we're, 
what we're here for today. I understand the policy implications, but as a practical matter, um, I, I think the ruling is the bright line is two years means two years, that's what it means. And I see my time's up. Are there any other questions, anybody? Thank you for your time, I appreciate it, as does my client. Thank you as well, Mr. Morris. The case then uh, is submitted and the bailiff may adjourn court. Hear ye, hear ye. The Honorable Supreme Court of the State of Iowa is now adjourned.